Um, I, uh, this is my first time in Oklahoma City. Uh, it's really nice here. I, I live in Jersey City. Um, we're the Garden State, but you guys have much more greenery than we do. <laughs> I'm not bitter about that. Um, so several months ago, uh, Amanda reached out to me and was like, would you like, we would love for you to propose a talk to our conference. And it was really, really nice. They're the nicest people in the world. Um, and at the time, I was dealing with a lot of stress um, with my job and open source development. And I had a really interesting conversation with somebody on IRC. And that sort of sparked the um, description of the, the talk that I gave to them. And that's how to build for non-developers. Uh, but then as I was writing the talk and as months went by, I sort of like changed my perspective on things. Um, so this talk is still about that, but it's a little bit more um, in my own voice. Um, starting out with the fact that open source is a prison. And this isn't satire, this is actually real. Sometimes I feel like I'm, I'm trapped in a prison of something that I love to do, but then I have to deal with like ridiculous stuff, like angry people. Um, bugs, of course, and stuff like that. Um, my name is Jen Schiffer. I'm an open web engineer at Boku. So most of my time is spent doing um, open source development. And I also have an open source project called make8bitart.com. It's an in-browser pixel art application, which I'm going to talk a lot about today. Um, so that IRC conversation I was mentioning, somebody had uh, PM'd me uh, saying, I'm going to make a PR pull requests on Make 8-Bit Art. And I was like, okay, cool. Like, what are you adding? Uh, and you don't always have to message someone at IRC to let them know that you're gonna do a pull request. Like, there's like mechanisms for that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so this guy, is a guy, said I'm adding your minified files to the like, gitignore and you shouldn't push those. Um, because if you go to the repo, uh, I have it on GitHub at Make 8-Bit Art, um, all of my minified files are there. I use Grunt um, for those tasks. And I do push them, I don't ignore them, and typically you do. But I said, when folks download the app just to draw, not actually build or contribute, they need the minified files to run, which is why I push them. Um, and he's like, I see, then you should just have them run Grunt tasks before they can start drawing. <laughs> I'm glad that you're laughing, because I, I was. <laughs> so I said, yeah, well, I'd rather eat dirt than teach my dad to install Node and Grunt just to draw friggin' pixel art. I might have been a little more explicit, explicit in my, my chat. <laughs> to, to, to which she said, fine, whatever, and the conversation ended there. Um, I get that a lot. Um, so makeitbitart.com is Again, it's an open source app. Um, I build it very openly. I tweet when I'm about to work on a feature just to get people excited and also to hold myself accountable in case I don't do it. And then people are gonna be like, hey, you said this is gonna be here, what the hell's your problem? Um, and it's something that I made for people who want to make pixel art, um, whether they know Node or Grunt or not, or are willing to contribute. Um, actually, I, I made it specifically for me, um, but the problem that I found through making this and building it openly uh, is seeing that there are developers who forget that there are people who are not developers. I get those people who say, I think maybe like 12 people have told me, you shouldn't push those files, just have them run grunt and it'll minify them and then they can open up the app and start working with it. Uh, and then when I explain to them, like not teaching my dad or, or your grandparents how to install a node and all that, um, I get fine whatever. And this sucks. Um, I, it, it sort of feel, I feel trapped because I want to like do well for the users of my app, which is what the intentions of the app being made are, but I also don't want to be combative against other open source developers um, and also people who might potentially want to contribute. Uh, but I feel like I'm being very reasonable in like my process. So um, I'm going to talk today about how to build for non-developers if you're interested in making apps that are not for making apps, um, why it's okay 
to build um, stuff for non-developers because there are people out there and there's actually an old friend of mine, we're not friends anymore, who said that I wasn't an actual person in tech because I didn't build a library that he actually uses in his development. And this is not an uncommon process. I'm sure a lot of people have heard this said about other people or themselves before. Um, but it's OK to build for non-developers. Um, and also, how to enjoy um, open source development and not make it feel like a prison, because it doesn't have to be. Uh, and also, basically, uh, whatever I feel like saying, because um, I've got the microphone. Um, so this talk is called Your Grandparents Probably Didn't Have Node. Um, Chris Williams says his grandparents do have Node. He's probably lying. Um, um, and and, and the, the reason uh, around the time that uh, Amanda had reached out to me, the, the issue I was going through is some family stuff uh, around my grandmother who was, was very dear to me. She raised me. She's a great inspiration to me. And she passed away right before I had uh, started graduate school. And she never had the internet. And she never got to see like the stuff that I built. And like I always like think of like when I'm building stuff, like she would really like this, but she probably wouldn't be able to figure out how to like actually use this. So it's sort of something I think about when I'm I'm making stuff, which is why I use the term grandparents. But really, you can fill this in with anybody, like your like milk delivery guy, if those exist, or. Um, you know, your, 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 your parents, your, your, your dads, uh, your dad's dads, that would be grandparents. Um, so there are 10 types of people in this world. I'm not even going to tell that joke. Um, there are two types of useful software that I see in open source. Um, code made for other developers and code made for users who may or may not be developers. Uh, and then the rest of the stuff is just people parking repo names or like, um, ridiculous diatribes for Gamergate, all that stuff, those don't count. Um, and these two need each other, just like software and, and hardware need each other, because if you don't have hardware, what's the software going to run on? If you don't have hardware, what's the software for? Um, when we are making products, whether it's for other developers to use, those products are being made to build products for people who might not be developers. You might be using Ember to build an app that tracks analytics for people who aren't developers that just wanted to get analytics from their, you know, whatever. Um, I use jQuery and make 8-bit art, uh, and that's a product that I use that was built for developers, and the product I'm building is for anybody. So these two go in hand. Um, and that brings to this parallel between art and science, um, and that's something I, I usually talk about a lot these days. Um, the importance of understanding that even though things are different and might seem like opposites of each other, they do need each other. Um, but I'm not going to just like talk about art and code like I have been. Um, I want to talk about the making of Make 8-Bit Art, which this morning I cleverly, without any sleep, coined Make Make 8-Bit Art. <laughs> So I mentioned before that makeapitart.com was made for me. Um, I'm really into drawing pixel art, and I guess like several years ago, the only application that like I used was um, MS Paint, which is probably one of the greatest pieces of software ever written, and that's true. It's just fantastic. Unfortunately, it's Windows only, and I became mostly a Mac user and an Open Solaris user. You'll forget that though. Um, <laughs> And so I had to look to other tools um, that were cheap. Um, I didn't want to pirate Photoshop. I mean, we all do at some point. Um, but even that was a little bit too much just to draw like pixel art. Um, there's this really great application called Pixin. And uh, actually, it's an existing app still. Uh, my coworker was using it the other day. Um, and it's in the Mac App Store, so it's Mac only. But a few years ago, it was still Mac only, but there was no Mac App Store. And you actually had to like open up Xcode. Ugh, um, and like run the app through there, like compile, you know, it's, it was just kind of a mess. It took longer to load Pixin than it did Photoshop, which is like a huge problem. Photoshop load is like a benchmark for like when your app should take, <laughs> honestly. Um, so I made it for me, um, and then other people started using it. Um, I just had it on make art.com it wasn't open source yet, and I was getting a lot of people who are also like comic book artists that were interested in pixel art, um, people who were teaching kids about computing and what cool stuff is on there were using it. I was getting emails from teachers all over the country. 
Um, I had people who um, would contact me and say, hey, can I buy makeapidart.com because we want to show it in the back of like shows for visualizations and stuff like that. And I was like, you don't have to buy it. I can just like send you the source code and use it. Um, so I ended up open sourcing it. It was really hard for me to do that. This was my baby for a couple of years at that point. Um, and I, I guess like I had the flu one day and just like in like a fever dream, I was just like, I'm gonna open source it. I'm gonna change it from private to public on GitHub and then let the world know, which is a really frightening experience because you're really putting yourself out there as a developer. And especially as a, as a woman developer, all eyes are already on the stuff that I make and the things that I say. So just putting all my code out there, I knew immediately there were gonna be people who were just gonna like go and look at all the lines of code and then do their little piece to remove white space and stuff like that. And that's exactly what happened. But at that point, I was really comfortable with myself and also my ability to um, shut them down verbally that um, I was okay with this. Unfortunately, not all people have that um, ability. I, I work at a job and worked at a job then that like either didn't care what I said or didn't know what I was saying or celebrated what I said, in this case at Boku. I was at the MBA at the time and they don't even like know what open source is. Um, so other people started contributing to the source and making significant contributions um, on top of like insignificant, which I would just ignore. Um, like we were adding keyboard shortcuts and um, touch events so that it worked on like mobile devices really well. And these are all really great contributions that made me feel okay with open sourcing it and not feeling like I was like in a fishbowl. There were people who were complaining that make 8-bit art is not 8-bit canon because it's like not on a on an 8-bit machine, like, whatever, dude. Um, and it's always dude. Uh, so the fact that there were people who were willing to add cool features um, to it and were polite and nice about it was like really great. And it made me feel like it wasn't a mistake going into um, open source development. Um, because I was getting more contributors, I wanted to make things um, easier um, for both the server and the uh, people contributing. So I introduced linting and minifying, and I was using Runt um, for those tasks. Uh, then I tried to figure out, OK, well, I have to push all of these minified files still, because people, artists, are downloading it, or I'm sending them downloads, um, and then opening it and not having Node and Runt whatever. Um, I refactored and changed the directory structure to make it as easy as possible for them to not F it up. Um, and that was just like a nightmare and still is something I'm struggling with today. Um, so here we are today. And makeapidart.com, it's still open. Um, the code is a hot mess, uh, which is why I like to talk about it a lot, to try to get people to help me out. Um, <laughs> So I learned a lot of things in this, in this process. Um, one, no one likes your decisions. Um, whether it's, you know, what language you're gonna write in, um, what your parents decided to name you, um, what you wear, what your handle is, how you speak on Twitter, all these things, no one likes it. Um, but your grandparents probably don't care how you built your app, so that's what I like to think of. Um, the paradox of choice is real, the struggle is real. There's so many things out there, so many you know, build tools, which are great. A lot of people, whenever someone comes out with a build tool at a meetup, they're like, oh, here goes another one, Like, what are you going to call it? Um, I think it's really great. I, I used to work in hyperlocal development before AOL's patch came out. I remember all the hyperlocal journalists were like, oh, AOL's taken over, there's going to be more sites in my town, this competition's terrible. Um, competition's really great. That's what keeps us making cool stuff and evolving. Um, we just need to be a little bit nicer about it. Um, but your grandparents might not need jQuery, or they might not not need it. Um, they don't care what you use in your app. So like, stop stressing. Um, also, nothing you make is ever good enough. Whether you're a, a male or a female or, 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 or anything, you, you just make garbage. And that's fine, because all of us just, just make garbage. Um, but your grandparents probably love you anyway. So it's important, I feel, and what I learned was to shift the focus um, of my open source development to the user of my tool and not necessarily the contributors. Although the contributors are important, so really what I mean is like the peanut gallery, the people who are just like on the side just waiting to like have their stupid voice heard. Um, 
unfortunately, the web is great where everybody can have their voice heard. Just some people are louder and should like stifle it a little bit. Um, I also um, learned that there are these three main aspects to think of that are usually an afterthought when building um, a tool, especially open source, because a lot of us are working on side projects where no one's really holding us accountable except the public. Um, and then when you're public or mostly jerks, you don't listen to them. Um, but the user should be who we're listening to, but they might not know how to vocalize what they need. So like the ease of retrieval, you know, how they're gonna get your application, um, accessibility, and also documentation. Um, we all hate those uh, words. Um, so your grandparents probably want to use whatever you're making. Um, if it's a product for non-developers or if your grandparents are developers, they are probably proud of you and they want to see what you're doing. Um, and so it's really cool to make things for people that aren't developers or, or not necessarily developers and have a wider audience to enjoy the stuff that you're making. Um, I've, I've made jQuery plugins that, you know, I know 20 people who use it or have like 30 stars on GitHub. And then I have make 8-bit art where I have on average 800 people a day like, drawing stuff on, which is really cool. And that's just on the website and not people who download it and use it locally because when they travel and they don't have the internet, um, they want to be able to use it. Um, so a lot of people, like to say, they're like, oh, just like get it on GitHub. I'm guilty of this. If you go on makeapitart.com, um, the link to get this is on GitHub. And this is kind of like not good and something I want to change because like your grandparents probably don't have GitHub or understand what to do when you get to that page. I too struggle when I go to a GitHub page to find out how to download it. Um, you have to click on like a drop down, I think, or something like that. Usually I end up just starring it and like going back to it at some other point. Or I just clone it, but like your grandparents don't know how to clone a repo. Um, I also usually um, get contacted by artists who are like, how do I get it? And I will just send them a zip file of the code and sometimes have to show them how to unzip it. And sometimes they don't have something to decompress files. And I end up spending a lot of time doing that type of support that I never thought I would have to do since I moved out of my parents' house. Um, so this too isn't really ideal, but it's better than, than GitHub. Um, but like your grandparents might not have internet access. Um, so you have to think of other ways to um, retrieve it or send it to them um, by CD or like if it's small enough floppy. I can send make it on a floppy disk. Um, and like your grandparents, you know, you, you don't know what kind of hardware that they're dealing with. These are all things that you should think about. Um, also, I like to look at how desktop apps are done for inspiration because um, everyone's all about apps and native apps. I'm not for native apps. I'm all about the open web. Um, so I like to steal ideas from desktop apps that make users think that they're using an app because when you think an app, you think I went to an app store and installed it, maybe paid a dollar or just complained about it being a dollar. Um, <laughs> So I like to make it look not like that. So like one idea I was thinking for Make Ape and Art was having like a cool splash page. Like grandparents love splash pages. Um, and we do this with a lot of our dev tools. You know what I mean? All, all the build, build um, tools have really awesome sites where you go and you just see their nice pretty logo. They all have really great design. Um, and there's like a link to like download this usually from GitHub. Um, so something like that I was thinking. Um, make it clear what file executes the app. So like web apps are typically a large collection of files and you can't really compile them into like one executable. Um, so like on make 8 art, I just have an index file. I should probably rename it to make 8 art. It's just something I've been thinking about and I just haven't gotten to the app yet. Um, but doing something like that or just sort of packaging it in a way that's easy for people to see how to actually get it running, uh, which is why I found myself um, redistributing all the contents and the file structure. Also, look into desktopifying um, it, perhaps. Uh, this guy, Tyler, works at Adobe. He sent me, um, I don't know if you can see this really well. No, that's not helping at all. Um, so Tyler sent me a message on GitHub. Um, he forked make Art and he used Node WebKit to make a Mac app version of make which is really, really cool. Um, if you want to uh, 
check out Node WebKit. It's really great. I think I think Intel um, is like sponsoring it, and it allows it, it allows you to sort of make like a desktop app from your HTML5 applications, um, and it's available for Mac, Windows, and Linux. So then you can get that executable file and send it, and that's really awesome. Um, so I've been working with him to look into that because if it's still HTML, then cool. I, I still don't like the idea of like app culture, but your grandparents were probably too old to like unlearn if they even know anything um, about that. Um, and your grandparents might struggle to use your application, which is why it's important to look into accessibility. Um, contrasting colors, screen reader ability, like how it sounds when a computer is yelling the thing back at you. Um, and different types of controls. And this is something that I struggle with and, and I've been reading a lot of books on accessibility and haven't put anything to practice because it's really, really hard. Um, I am a, like mostly like a back-end developer, front-end developer now. Um, accessibility is a whole other field that's really important that we all know about and also appreciate that there are people who are really good at it um, and can make sure that our apps can be used. Uh, make 8-bit art is extremely um, strange because it is a visual tool for drawing. Um, so like some things like screen reader ability, like would be cool, but like is it useful? They still can't draw, but maybe there's a way that we can let them draw, whether it's like showing what coordinates the mouse is on and stuff like that. Um, people who are um, less able than the rest of us are usually really good at like compensating with other great abilities of using tools. Uh, my, my old secretary at Montclair State, her son um, couldn't use his hands very well, and so he made like his own game controller when the Nintendo came out, uh, and it, was, it looked like the handle of like a shovel with buttons on it, and he just played better than anybody uh, in the neighborhood. Uh, so it's like really important to make sure that these, these apps are accessible to um, everybody. Um, none of us are less lesser than, than the other. Um, Marcy Sutton is someone that you should follow on Twitter if you want to learn more about accessibility. She gave a great talk at JSConf. Um, and also, uh, Katie Cunningham, she wrote the accessibility handbook uh, for O'Reilly. Uh, she's a Python developer, and she's really awesome, has given great talks. So usually when I struggle with this accessibility game, those two are the ones that I uh, holler at and annoy. Your grandparents probably do need to read the manual. The fun manual, that's what that stands for. <laughs> the other day, um, I was eating dinner with a bunch of uh, developers. It was a really fancy dinner. It was all vegetables or whatever. Uh, um, and they were talking about, they're, they're, a lot of them work in education and teaching code and uh, studying pedagogy. And they're talking about this um, activity um, called the peanut butter and jelly activity, I guess. And it was a process for teaching students how a computer learns to do things through our programming it by telling the students, okay, one person has these ingredients, the peanut butter, the jelly, and a bag with a loaf of bread in it. Um, and you, uh, the other student is to give instructions to the student with the ingredients on how to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Uh, and usually, and you have to take it literally because computers are very literal. Uh, so you know, you have a student, the student who's given the direction saying, "Okay, take the bread and put peanut butter on it on one side," and the student with the ingredients takes the loaf in the bag and starts spreading peanut butter all over it. And the other student's like, "No, that's not what I said." And it's like, "No, that is what you said. That's literally what you said. What you meant was this. You have to be very granular in your instructions." So when you're writing documentation for people who aren't developers, or even for people who are developers, because I need very granular directions, um, I don't like to pay, pay attention to things. So the more, the more that you're specific with how to use something, um, not like download and open index.html. Well, what is index.html? Why is it HTML? Where is it downloading to my machine? What should I look for? What if it's a zip file? Like all these things, this is why documentation is really hard and we hate it. Um, it's a lot of work, but it's really super important if we want um, our users to be able to do this stuff. And if you don't write documentation that's really good, you end up losing time 
by explaining to individuals on an individual basis how to use your app, or worse, you ignore them, and then they're angry, and then you're stuck in that prison all alone. Um, also, your grandparents probably use IE8. Android joke. Um, so the, the technology that, that people are using is different. We all know that know this. This is another nightmare um, of our life, our prison of open source. Um, a couple of months ago, um, there were some tweets. You guys know Twitter? Uh, of this PHP developer who really, oh, really, oh, this guy. Uh, he is, he's a PHP developer, and he always gets on WordPress's case. Um, WordPress is a blogging CMS platform built on a LAMP stack that I do a lot of development with. Um, he's complaining about how WordPress supports an end-of-life version of PHP, uh, and that it's holding back innovation from PHP. But the problem is, is if WordPress doesn't support those older versions, about 25%, I think it is, of WordPress users are using this old version of PHP on their server. And this developer and a lot of other developers think, well, if you stop supporting it, then those people will upgrade it. So I wrote a blog post. You guys know blogs, right? Um, that was like a fake dialogue between my dad and I of me trying to teach him how to upgrade PHP on a server. And what I learned using a hosting company that, that I uh, use for some of my stuff is that I don't know how to upgrade PHP with the console that they provide. And sort of the blog ended there. It was just like, nope, I'm done sticking with the old PHP, and this is the problem that WordPress has. So it's really not so easy as like, oh, just tell them to upgrade. as developers, like, oh, npm install, because there's a package JSON file, like, grandparents don't know that. Um, but maybe your grandparents, like Chris Williams, is, do have Node, and, or they want to install Node. We should make developing tools for non-developers to make things easy. Um, and this is the rant part of my talk. Um, I, uh, I went to a graduate school in Montclair State, it's also where I got my bachelor's, and I did a lot of work in the command line. Um, writing a lot of Lisp, um, a lot of Java, um, running off of a, a, a Sun Microsystems computer that had all the compilers and stuff, because that stuff gets expensive. We can't do it individually, because these aren't open web technologies. Um, and I remember when I started using Git, that they had like graphical user interface um, applications for it. And I tried it, but like it didn't work for me. I like to go back to the command line. Uh, and then I would hear other developers who were like, like GUIs, like those are for noobs, they're stupid. Like, oh, we don't even do support on our graphical user interface stuff because like I, I just rather use the command line. But try explaining to your grandparents or other people how to do things in the command line. Yes, our graphical user interface like applications for accessing these tools are garbage, um, but that's our fault. You know, GUIs are not hard. They've been around for longer than most of you or, and myself have been. Um, so I feel like we need to shift our focus, um, a little bit of it at least, back to improving um, the GUI tools that we provide for development so that we have less of um, a learning curve or less steep of a learning curve for developers to jump into. Um, I feel like when, when I was teaching at Montclair State, there was nothing more intimidating to students who knew how to program, but I was moving them to front-end development, teaching the node. There's nothing more intimidating to them than asking them to open up the terminal and type in things. You know, we there's a reason why Windows is really popular. Um, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, the, the, just having something visual is usually best for most of our users. So I think it's really important um, for those of us who are building tools for other developers to also think about that when we're building our uh, CLI um, apps. Uh, another, uh, an off, um, on a tangent, 
Uh, I once did an interview for a front end dev shop uh, when I graduated and the guy asked if I know CLI and I said no because I didn't know that CLI was like how people abbreviate command line interface. So also like recognize that we don't know all of the jargon. I didn't get the job, but I ended up at the MBA, so I mean whatever. Um, <laughs> So, as I mentioned before, I'm still working on all of these things. Um, so, Make APNR is very broken. It is a hot mess. Um, but these are things that I'm learning, and this is a process, and that's a part of development, is that we're constantly learning and hopefully teaching, uh, which is why I'm here in front of you today. Um, but sometimes open source is a prison, and you have people who are haters and call you out and use their platform to be angry at you. Um, and this is a part of the, the issue that I have with open source development is that people have um, a voice, but they don't know how to use that voice constructively. Um, I always love to show that because that just made me so angry, so shout out to Christian. Um, but open source doesn't have to be a prison. Um, your grandparents probably don't care about your contrib graph or the number of repos that you have. Um, they just want your stuff to work. Um, and they want it to work instantly. Um, we all feel the same way about our tools. We don't want to have to do like a ton of stuff. Um, and not all people are haters or will call you out on things inappropriately in a public sphere. Some people will really appreciate the stuff that you made, whether they're non-developers who want to draw portraits of their lovely girlfriends uh, and thank you, or even just developers themselves that want to use your app. And this is the reason why I continue to do open source, because it's such a wider audience, it's something that's accessible to everyone, and if people want to get involved and have fun with it, then they can do that. Um, and the people appreciate you, your grandparents probably appreciate you, uh, and, and so do I. So thank you very much. Do I have any questions? Mike, in the back. Yeah, uh, I was wondering, what's an example of a project uh, that you think is really good at doing the things that you described are really hard? Um, he asks, what are projects out there that do something really good with what I described as being very hard? I think that, let me see, I don't know. The issue is that there aren't a lot of, um, that I've encountered, open source applications that are non-developer tools. Um, and the ones that they do, do do something like distributing it in an executable file. Um, and that's what's really great about um, HTML5 is that we can do that. Um, I don't, this is what where my struggle with refactoring make APIT art is, is that I ask people, how would you do this? And they say, I have no idea because they don't do like similar stuff. So if you have ideas or know of other projects that are not developer focused that can do that, please get in touch with me or you can do a pull request and you don't have to PM me on IRC. You can just go ahead and do it. I get an email like GitHub does that. It's pretty cool. <laughs>
Yeah, so you can, so he was saying like, what if he, you have like a branch for, that's developer friendly and doesn't have those um, files, the build files, and then have the branch for people to download. And that just makes it all the more complicated. I'd like to have a single ecosystem because this isn't a tool that's for developers to develop on plus for people to draw. This is a drawing application. But if you don't like that, you can fork make a bit art. A lot of people have forked it and, and done their own cool stuff with it or haven't done anything. Um, so yeah, that's the point of open source. You might come up with something that's really great and down the line I'm like, hey, this is awesome. Can I merge it? Open source, woo. Are you doing anything new with Um, Right now, so for makeapitart.com, um, I have some features that I want to do, but I want to clean up the code, make it more modular. Um, which is also part of making it easier for contributors, because um, right now it is kind of a mess. Um, and then I've been, actually, most of my focus with 8-Bit Art has been drawing it, because that's why I made this app. And so now that it's sort of got the features that I look for, I draw a lot with it every day. And that's actually a good thing to do when you're making a tool for non-developers, is use it every day, because you have your own testing, you see like what would be cool and whether it be feasible to do it or not. I have a lot of people that post issues on the GitHub, um, and a lot of them are really not feasible with the other features that are going on, um, and I have to like figure out a way to explain that, which is why like verbal and communication skills are pretty important um, in all aspects of life, but especially when you're when you're dealing with people who don't know your jargon. Um, like if you go to a person, say, download this branch and not the other branch, well, they might be like, "What is branch?" Something like that. <laughs> Boku pays me a lot of money to build um, web apps for clients and we also have 25% open source time. So I would feel disingenuous to be paid to do um, open source time and work on this and then like charge people to use it. Also, because this is developed so openly uh, with people watching, uh, I don't have a lot of time to refine things. I want to keep adding more and more and more, which is why it's kind of a mess now. Uh, and I would feel bad charging people to do that. And also if I charge someone, if I charge people to use it or to get the source, um, one, I would have to make it private on GitHub. Um, I would have to deal with the fact that I'll, that would probably anger people who would then like pirate it. And like the idea of pirating an open source project is kind of ridiculous, but you see that with premium WordPress themes all the time, and those usually end up having like m malware and, and, and stuff like that attached to it, and then people are going to think that I'm hacking them. Um, so yeah, I don't want to deal with that. John Resick, he always has people that think that uh, he hacked them because their site was hacked and they see jQuery in the in the source code and his name's on it. Uh, so he'll get like angry tweets and stuff like that from people saying, this guy John hacked it, he's the hacker. Like, I do not want to deal with that. <laughs> it's enough dealing with like the developers. I don't want to deal with like the angry, confused grandpas. <laughs> yeah. yeah, how long into this project did you realize that more non-developers were using it than developers? Like, what was that point where you realized your users were kind of setting the direction? So I, I was getting emails. And we don't email each other, you know? You tweet at each other. So it's getting all these emails. I'm like, oh, people email. Um, besides like Chase and whatever's pretending to be Chase. And so I was like, oh, there are people that are using this. And there, there are teachers who are like, oh, I, I use this in my class, in our computer class to, you know, for downtime in between them doing like math games, I have them make pixel art. And one of them accidentally viewed the source of the page. And I have a lot of ASCII dinosaur art and the index file. And I have people who say, oh, I showed my kid the source of your page and they saw the dinosaurs and they want to learn how to do ASCII art and they want to learn HTML, which is like the coolest thing in the world. Um, but uh, I think that also like if you, if you make a tool and you, you name it properly, um, it's easier to track the usage. So like makeapitart.com, um, I search Twitter for makeapitart, that's one word, and I get people who, who tweet about the app and also post their artwork. So the two screenshots that I had um, earlier, this was posted um, like 
last night, and I think this, yeah, this one was less than a month ago. Um, so I like to uh, keep track of that sort of stuff. Um, that's also how I'm able to see like developers who are, who are talking smack about me, um, so I can shout out back at them. Uh, which is also another important thing I, I, I should have touched upon, with not just with that tweet, but like we since we all are trying to like make cool stuff i hope when you see people who are writing something where something's wrong or they're making something and they're doing it incorrect way the worst possible thing that you can do besides like murdering them is <laughs> calling them out in a public sphere even if you like at reply them or whatever like we all even though we all might not email each other like we all have emails i have like 30 email addresses that all forward to one um so Janet.biz.info, you can email me there. Um, so we have to like think of the whole like do unto others as you like to be done unto you. Like if you don't want someone yelling at you to like all their followers about how you're a terrible developer, then you shouldn't do that either. Um, so try to find a way. And the cool thing about GitHub is that like usually our emails are on there, or you can like open up an issue or just tweet at someone saying, hey, can I have your email? I have a suggestion or something like that. Like, just be a little nicer. Um, because I know that when people are combative against me, I get combative right back at them like 10 times more. Uh, and I'm dangerous. So that's just something to, to look out for. Um, but yeah, the, the feedback from the non-developers is the one that's most important to me. Because again, I made this for myself to do a non-developer activity. So track your stuff and see how people are using it. And like thank them for thanking you, because that's cool too. And then cool things will happen. This is Making Fit Art was on display at the Game On exhibit in the Ontario Science uh, Center. So like it was in like a museum exhibit and stuff like that. And that was because um, someone had made something with it and I said thank you and the guy's like, hey, I want this in my exhibit. So cool things happen when you're cool and nice. Go figure. I have my moments though, but you know. Any other questions? Okay. Uh, so sometimes I, I get some just open source stuff and I get what I think is like hate or their criticism, but really it's just they don't know how to convey what they're saying. So do you ever get that? Do you ever turn those around or do you just shut the door off? I think on a weekly basis I tell someone, this is not how you speak to somebody. <laughs> because again, yeah, that's a problem. Like, there are people who just don't know how to communicate. You know what I mean? A lot of us who go to college for computer science or engineering weren't given, like, I guess, um, adequate tools for learning communication with non-developers. And this is a big problem in our industry, obviously. We all know this, what's going on. Um, and so, I have the ability to call out people online, which is is a privilege in itself, um, which is why I make it a point to, even though I you know, get people yelling back at me all the time. Um, it's when people say something to you and you can tell that maybe they're just not wording it correctly, like it's okay to say like, by the way, like, like thank you for your suggestion. I wouldn't word this in this way because it kind of comes off as rude. Hashtag rude you might use on Twitter. Um, but yeah, that's definitely an issue and it's also a barrier to open source because sometimes when I'm having a bad day, it just something as simple as that will trigger me and I'll be like, I'm done, I'm going back to Java. Um, and that's sort of like the, the struggle every day. It's going back to enterprise. I don't want to have to go back to enterprise software. It's not much better on that end anyway. So I've always been really into art um, and programming and didn't have much access to them until like later high school years. And I realized when I started teaching um, at Montclair that people were all pretty into art, whether it's making or like coloring and all that sort of stuff like that. So I figured why don't I use that to get them to get excited about programming? And that worked out really well. But then I was like, well, maybe we can do this the other way around. We get the developers who, are, who would tell me that I'm wasting my time making art when I should be like learning like Ember, Angular, and all that sort of stuff like that. Like, oh, you don't know every JavaScript framework and how to use it? Like, duh. 
Um, like, no, I'm an artist. Get over it. Um, so I launched this project last month called uh, VART, or VART. Um, it's at vart.institute, and it is a writing art. <laughs> Most of the comments about it have been about the TLD. Like, yeah, they're real. Um, it's, a, it's a writing um, art and code project where I write about um, well-known artists. I did Pete Mondrian to launch it, and Renee McGreed's going to be next. I write about their history, brief blurb about it, and then I programmatically generate their work using JavaScript. So it is a project that sort of goes the other way around where it's I know an artist, and in order to know an artist, I should try to become like the artist. And I am a JavaScript developer. That is my medium, and that's what I created. Uh, and so I had a lot of people who are developers who have art degrees uh, saying, this is really cool. Like, thank you for validating that like my art degree wasn't a waste. Because another thing that we like to do in this industry is um, uh, invalidate everyone else's backgrounds to make us feel better about ourselves. I'm guilty of this too. Um, so sort of taking the creative aspect of things and incorporating it into the more scientific is really important, which is what I had mentioned earlier. Um, but yeah, so. Good question. Any, any other questions? All right, well, thank you very much. And thank you so much for having me. It's been great.